So our homework for today, which is the very last chapter in the reader, is Kirk Hansen. Kirk Hansen, uh, his topic is a little bit different than all the others because it's about international leaders. And what is the big difference between international leaders and leaders on the national or subnational level? Which international leader did we have so far? Dag, Dag Hammarskjöld, who was? Swedish. He was Swedish, yes, but was his, what was his job description, his day job? He was the second general secretary of the United Nations. So, let's have a look at this now using the theories we've studied. What is the first theory we were introduced to as far as analyzing ethical leadership? No, the first leader. First theory based on a theoretician, somebody who developed a full-blown theory. Deontology is not a theory. Deontology is an approach. And it's the opposite of utilitarianism, which is also not a theory. So those of you who chose deontology as a theory, that's incorrect. Who was the first theoretician? The first person? Kohlberg. Lawrence Kohlberg, the most famous professor, researcher in, and he did a lot of practical work too, in the field of ethics and psychology. By the way, this is the symbol for psychology. He established empirical ethics as an undisputed approach to ethics and, and morality because he not only said what we should do, which would be not empirical, but no, not what we should do, which is not empirical, it's unempirical, thank you. It's normative. Normative ethics is as old as humanity. All religions use a normative approach. And where do they get their norms from as a rule? Where do religions get? Not from the Pope, no, I'm sorry. From books? Yeah, more like the book. If you're Christian, Jewish, or Muslim, it comes from the book, which comes from ultimately from, from God, the divine, the sacred sources. The sacred sources give us norms upon which we can base our lives. What Kohlberg does is take a new approach, namely not looking at what people should do, but what they do, how they act, and then codifying these, this behavior. So, that's one option. What's another option for your paper? The next one. Rest, which is neo-Kolbergian. Not post-Kolbergian, neo-Kolbergian. What's the big difference between rest and Kohlberg? Okay, two, there's two issues, but the, the, the big one is not backsliding. Black, backsliding is the result of the primary difference, which is the The staircase approach. This is the accusation, this is the main criticism of Kohlberg by neo-Kohlbergian thinkers, that you have to first be on phase one, then you go to phase two, and ultimately you get to phase six. And because of that approach, there's no backsliding. The backsliding is only an aspect of the, more, of the, of the bigger issue, which is the staircase. You cannot be post convention This is important for a region like the Middle East, but also for Eastern Europe or Latin America. You cannot be post-conventional, according to Kohlberg, unless you're first conventional, which assumes that we're living in what kind of a society? Based on what? Rule of law. Now, if you're living in a society that's not primarily, of course, every society has criminals and unethical people, but if the society is predominantly based on rule of law, like Sweden, where uh, Dag Hammarskjöld grew up, you're trained into ethical behavior on the conventional level and then you internalize it on the post-conventional level. That doesn't work in Russia. That doesn't work in Mexico. That doesn't work in Lebanon. Because here, the experience is primarily a culture of impunity. As a rule, we don't assume that people who break rules are going to automatic, automatically get caught and be punished. As a rule, we don't assume the people who obey rules are going to be rewarded. And in some 
exceptional cases, people who obey rules will be punished. This is, this is what makes Kohlberg's theory so inadequate and leads us to consider which option? Rest, obviously, rest, which provides what possibility? Okay, okay, first of all, that people can be ethical and unethical at the same time, that's important, but that people can be post-conventional without being conventional first. If you're living in a system like all women, for example, because every society in the world has always been, historically speaking, because even the theories of patriarchal societies assume that these societies ruled by women are prehistorical. So in all historical societies, men have dominated. So if you're growing up as a woman, you'll have a problem with a conventional approach, simply because the rules are stacked in the favor of men. But if you grow up in Russia, communist Russia, same thing, but now it's the party which establishes a set of rules which override the, the government. So you are used to a system where there's, there's the rules that the government passes, the laws, the norms, and then there's the reality which has little to do with the actual convention. So you, it's, you have a hard time being conventional. So what are the other two options that REST provides? That's conventional. <laughs> Maintaining norms is the restian term for conventional. The other two options? Self-interest, personal interest. You do, you, I'm number one. Whatever suits me, I just go and do it. Which means that you will tend to be unethical. But interestingly enough, we have a higher rate of post-conventional thinking. Why do women, according to REST's research data, tend to be more post-conventional than men? Women have, if, if you're living in a society which is sexist, which are all societies, being conventional is tough. So you can say, I'll just live with it and work twice as hard, which a lot of women do. Or you can say, I'm just going to go break the rules. Or you can aspire to something higher. So this is, statistically speaking, been documented by REST that women, that's not a lot higher, but it's, it's, it is statistically significantly higher the female t tendency and the tendency of people in post-communist countries slightly higher to be post-conventional because they don't have which option? Maintaining norms. Maintaining norms, if that's, that's not in your interest, then you'll tend to the two extremes, which are anything goes, let's just be criminal, looking out for number one, or a lot of people, this is the World Values surveys the various surveys of values around the world have shown that a lot of people do want to be good. They just don't know how to live that out. Okay, so now let's look at the international level. What do we know about the national and subnational level? Who enforces the rules? The government, who else? Engineers, when you go and open up an engineering company or you work for an engineering company, who enforces the rules? The syndicates, which is Lebanese English for professional associations. Just be aware of the fact that syndicate in English can also mean mafia, which is maybe a coincidence. Anyway, so, so when you're speaking to people who are not from Lebanon, who are not French educated, you use the word syndicate, they might not know what you mean. So use professional associations. Okay, government, professional organizations are self-governing, which means that once you are a member of a engineering, pharmacy, doctors, lawyers, uh, architects, etc. Once you're a member of these professional associations, you govern yourselves, okay? The, the actual government itself, the government, the professional associations, who else? Enforces rules? Okay, school, educational institutions? Very good, religion, religious institutions, you don't have to be in a country like Lebanon where you actually have religious courts. In many parts of the world which are officially secular, religious institutions do have some sort of ability to sanction behavior, to punish people for not acting properly. Ultimately, in a country like France or the US, 
if you don't obey the religious rules, the only option they have is to throw you out of the religious institution. So if you're Catholic and you don't abide by the dogmas of Catholicism, they will kick you out. More they can't do. By the way, why don't, it's called excommunication. Why is it so difficult to be excommunicated in Lebanon? If, let's say, you don't believe in God and you're a Maronite, and so they say, well, that's not acceptable. We're going to excommunicate you. Who's going to take you? They, can't, they, can, they can throw you out, but where are, they going to th- where are they going to throw you to? Are the Shia or the Sunnis going to take you if you don't believe in God? No. Oh. So no one will take you. There's, so these kind of sanctions, but there are the institutions of the family status court. So again, on the national level, on the subnational level, we have actual enforcement, which means we, people grow up with an experience of conventional behavior, at least in some way. What about the international level? Which bodies, similar to the national level, enforce rules? The United Nations. Which bodies within the United Nations? The Security Council, for example, the ICC, the International Criminal Court, which is now active in Lebanon. What, what are the UN Security Council and the ICC often accused of? Bias. Why are almost all the cases in the ICC cases from Africa? What's What's the big deal? Why, why don't they have a couple of Americans and Israelis in there, too? What, what happened? Remember Sharon? He was supposed to be... <laughs> he was supposed to, right? Uh, the U.S. will not allow its nationals to be tried by the ICC. So, bias. So, so on the international level, we have the U.N. institutions. We have the European Union institutions, which are not, not global, but they're regional. On the economic level, who can enforce the law? WTO. Okay, I'm glad, I'm glad you said that. The, the WTO. Is the WTO in the business of introducing rules? No. It's in the, abolishing them. The whole purpose of the WTO is to deregulate. This is what we saw in 2008. There's no global institution to enforce legality within the financial services industry. So that anything goes. They can start gradually reintroducing some, some rules, but the point is, and this is what um, Kirk Hansen, uh, the point Kirk Hansen makes is, there's no conventional experience on the global level. So where do global leaders, according to Doug Hammarskjöld, get their ethics from? Which is? On the? On the national level. So the whole, the whole, um, challenge, if you will, is taking your national conventional thinking and globalizing it, making it able to transcend existing situations. So transcending is one of the key issues that global leaders do. National leaders can also transcend existing norms, but as a rule, they don't. As a rule, they try to abide by the existing laws, and if they don't like the existing laws, what do they do? They, they change them. They go through the normal legislative or court process of changing the laws to fit a new situation, for example. So, let's get out the reader and have a look at the article. You all read the article for today, at least that was your assignment. And I'm sure that you were really busy over the weekend reading this article. It was tough reading. It was the long, long, it was the longest article in the reader. It's hard, right? It's only about five pages. But don't let this article fool you. There's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff in there. And by the way, this entire article is obviously going to be on the test next Tuesday. It will be. Of course. Of course. What was, the, what was the first test on? No, the first test was on? And rest, right? We stop with rest, right? So in this test, we have our great friend Zimbardo. 
Dr. Evil. Okay. So, Zimbardo, Hill, and Hansen, which is basically the entire rest of the reader, yeah? So, now, over the last several years, the last three years ex to be exact, okay, D were you going to raise your hand? No? Okay, good. Uh, were you the two girls I kicked out last time? No? Okay. You want to be the ones I kick out this time? No? Uh, Maria, why don't you just tell me who they are and then I'll take care of it, okay? Um, this is what we call a bully pulpit. When you're up in a pulpit like this, you can bully the students. Okay. Hansen is, again, relatively theoretical as opposed to Hill, which had very exact examples. The two countries that Hill dealt with are Italy and South Africa. Two countries with a very strong tradition of culture of impunity. In both of those countries, if you were Lebanese, you'd feel right at home. Uh, the Italians really, I mean, I, I like to take my Lebanese students, my NDU students to Italy to make them feel good about Lebanon. The Italians are often worse <laughs> than the Lebanese, especially in organizing government institutions. Anyway, um, so let's have a look now. Open your reader to the last article, which is Perspectives on Global Moral Leadership. Notice he uses the word moral here, as opposed to ethical. ethical. Now, why is that? Moral is more theoretical? No, you're using the word theoretical incorrectly. What does theoretical mean? Theory. It's based on theory. Thank you. That's, that's what we call a... What's big red and eats rocks? A big red rock eater, don't use the word you're defining in the definition. You do that on the test, I mark it wrong. So, what is the difference between moral and ethics? Theoretical is what? What does theoretical mean? Theories are developed through experience and, or which is, experience, another word for that would be observation, and testing or experimentation. Experimentation and observation allow us to develop theories. There's no theories, ultimately, without empirical testing. So that's not what, the, that's, this is not theoretical in that sense. Uh, it's, it's practical, but it's not, the article's not using a lot of practical examples. We have a, we have a couple in the end, but it's giving us some, some, some general concepts which Hansen has developed through a long, long period of study in the field. So let's have a look now. If you want to turn to the very first page in the handwriting at the bottom, it's 81, it's 291 in the, in the, test, in the text, at the very bottom, at its essence, Moral leadership is about calling others to critical ethical values and behaviors that emanate from them. So, behavior emanates from ethical values. In my view, moral leadership is distinct from ethical leadership. So, what's the difference? He's saying there's a difference. Moral leadership is distinct from ethical leadership addressed elsewhere in the book. Ethical leadership is about leading an organization or people to accomplish its core purposes using well, he's guilty of big red rock, big red, big red rock eaterism right there. Using ethical means. What are ethical means? What's what are ethics? Standardized, Standardized or codified. codified morals. So the problem with the global level, with the international level, is there are no standards or codes. 
So you can't be conventional on the global level for the very simple reason that there are no conventions that can be applied, what's another better word, using violence, using force, enforced. There are obviously rules and standards on the global level. The problem is, is if you break those rules, normally nothing happens. So if you're going to abide by rules where there's no punishment, where there's basically a culture of impunity, there's no enforcement, the only way to be a good leader is to be moral, taking your ethical experience from the national level and applying it to the international level. So let's see what he says here. Moral leadership, we're now on the next page, 82. Moral leadership is about leading an organization or people to accomplish an explicitly moral purpose. Again, big red rock eater right there. Moral leadership usually involves transformation. Okay, important term, right? Keep that. Transformation, which means, what does transformation mean? Okay, trans means across or through. So you, you reform or change something into something else. So transformation, for example, by introducing a people to a new moral value or calling out behavior from the group consistent with a moral value that is not currently practiced. So it, it's about going beyond the existing. Now, for the last three years exactly now, a little bit more, I've been taking our favorite local leader, Bashar al-Assad, and studying his behavior to find out if he's a global moral leader. I'm not joking. I'm not Charles Assad. You don't know who that is. Yeah, of course. Uh, so uh, some of you will go, oh, yeah, he's a great guy. He's defending us from the takfiri. Right? The other ones are going to go, no, he's a horrible guy. He's killing his own people, blah, blah, blah. OK, you're all situated somewhere on the spectrum within the Lebanese political system. I'm sure of that. There's very few people who say, well, you know what's happening in Syria? Eh, I don't really care one way or the other. I doubt there's anybody in this room who thinks that way. So for those, yeah, there are. You don't care one way or the other at all? You don't care about 1.5 million refugees in Lebanon? Where do you live? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> anyway, some people just don't notice what's going on. OK, good. For the rest of us who do care somehow, uh, you get used to it. Well, that's, yeah. OK, that's. Getting used to it means actively ignoring it. Anyway, good. So if you, if you for example, think that Bashar al-Assad is a good guy, how do we measure that? We should know by now. You just can't go say stuff, especially if you want to pass the course. You have to use theory. Now, is Bashar al-Assad exclusively a leader on the Syrian level. What, what, what is the term that's often thrown around a, between Iran and Lebanon? The arc of resistance. The arc of resistance, going from Tehran through Syria to Lebanon and Palestine. Now the Palestinians are sort of like opting out a little bit. But the arc of resistance, by its very nature, is not a national phenomenon. Now you can say, I don't believe in that. But is this a goal of Iranian, Syrian Ba'ath Party, Hezbollah, and Hamas? Is this a goal, or was it a goal at some time? Thus, it's an international issue. Iran, Iraq, oh yes, I did forget Iraq, yeah. Not to, not to forget. Okay, that's a relatively interesting coalition, which would put Syria's government pretty much in the center of that global confrontation, because who is this resistance arc resisting? 
besides Israel? The United States. Now, if you want to be global, pick a fight with the U.S. <laughs> so they just did, right? So the, the conflict is Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine versus the U.S., the EU, oh, if, now, Turkey, Saudi Arabia. So we're talking here about a global phenomenon. So we could now use Hansen's approach to test Erdogan, test Assad, test Obama, and find out if they're not gl global leaders, because they obviously are. Are they moral leaders? Are their practices based on codes, declared norms? Well, that mean, why no? They just do whatever they want? They're totally inconsistent. One day he wakes up and does this, the next day he wakes up and does the opposite? Who's, <laughs> yeah, I think they do. Yeah, okay, good. So, let's have a look now at the list on page 83. This is why it's always good to have your reader with you. On page 83, page 295 in the, in the copy, photocopy, we have four items which are give us the characteristics of a global moral leader. Now, again, you don't have to accept these. You don't have to accept Zimbardo's approach. Obviously, you don't have to accept Rest or Kohlberg, because they contradict each other. You can't, you can't accept both of them. They're mutually exclusive. For your paper, you need to choose one and justify it. This is one of the weaknesses with a lot of the paper proposal for both, yes. They don't have to be the same one. You can say, well, I'm studying the water policy in Lebanon and I'm going to use rest. I'm studying the Panama Canal and I'm going to use uh, Zimbardo, whatever. You don't, I just said, you don't have to use the same one for both examples. You can use different ones. You have to have a theory for both examples. For example one, it can be one theory. That, uh, he's raising his hand, right? You're, is that you're raising your hand? Yeah. You were talking, I saw your hand going up, that's what's going to save you. No, you did raise your hand. Yeah, but if you hadn't done that, I would have thrown you out. Okay, so, right, so, the paper, very briefly, very briefly, we'll go over this again, very briefly, point one, the paper has to be dealing with your major. No, it's not. No, it's not. You're not trying hard enough. The paper has to be dealing with your major. Number two, they have to be real examples. Now, what does that mean, real examples? Some of you said, Sally works for a company in Asia. That's obviously not a real example. Bob, on the other hand, works for the government in Africa. These are what-if examples from your textbook. I know where you get them from, right? So it has to be the head, a CEO of a company. It has to be a minister in the government. It has to be a head of an NGO. It has to be a real person. You just, you, you just go look for them. It's very private? No, it's not. There are plenty of examples from your major. Keep trying. So, it has to be a real leader. It has to be real cases. Guys, raise your hand. The cases have to be actual cases. Now, I made, you, I made the point that if you're going to choose an example from your own experience, and you say, well, that's private or that's personal, then you can't choose it. You have to cite your sources. If you say, I was working in the summer for a restaurant and the owner of the restaurant decided to use spoiled meat, but I can't tell you who he is because then he'd go to jail, then you can't use that example. I'm sorry. Because what prevents me from thinking you just made that up? So you have to be able to cite sources. So one, from your major. Two, real examples, actual cases from, the, from your research, or from your experience, then they have to be leaders, which means it has to be somebody in a leadership position, which means that they have to be in charge, 
and the people who are under them, if caught, will ultimately not be the ones who is arrested. It'll be the, the person in charge. It can't be the government of Canada, like someone wrote. The government of Canada is a leader. No, it's not. I'm sorry. You have ministers, you have judges, you have generals, but the government of Canada is not a person. Then it has to be a dilemma. We have four of them. It has to be a good, good dilemma. Then you have to choose a theory. Study the case with Rest. Study the case with Hansen, whatever. If I put an R on your submission, that means you have to resubmit it. For the six of you who got an OK, six of you who got an OK, you're one of them? Oh, you're so happy, right? OK. That means it's, it's, it's good. And I think in all the cases, both examples were great, OK? Which means she has a dilemma, she has a theory, she has an actual leader, an actual case. Go look at what she did. It's, and, by the way, if you did not use APA, you don't have to resubmit, but you will need to use APA. OK. Good. I'm not going to talk about that from the stage. OK. Good. Let's look at the four items. People who talk need to raise their hand and ask questions. Uh, Maria, you're actually encouraging them. No, you don't. No, you don't. Please. This is, a, this is a 60 student class. We can't have the people in the back asking Maria questions. I'm sorry. No. No. OK. You want to leave? OK. I didn't want to have to do this on camera, but obviously I seem to have to, OK? Athalia was tougher than you, Maria. Athalia is a, is a professional training coach, so she can crack the whip, right? There's a skill you have to acquire, right? OK. <laughs> <laughs> through time, okay, through time. Okay, guys, guys. What are the characteristics of a global moral leader? Now let's apply them to our good friend Bashar al-Assad. A personal commitment to a set of values that transcend a single nature, nation or culture. Does the arch of resistance transcend a single nation? Obviously, otherwise it wouldn't be an arch. Does it transcend a culture? Which, other con which countries back the arc of, arch of resist resistance besides Russia? Which countries are known for being pro-China China and Venezuela? So obviously, this arc of resistance transcends not only a nation, but also a culture. What is the thing that all these countries have in common? Uh, I, well, I, I'm going I'm to be on their side for the moment. And I would say maybe they're just sick of American arrogance. Maybe the fact that the U.S. thinks they can get away with anything, they please get some certain people's nerves who have the resources to do something about it. Why does Venezuela stand up to the U.S., although it's very close, it's a neighbor? What gives them the power to stand up to the U.S.? Their oil reserves. China, of course, is a huge country. Russia, a huge country. Uh, so you could say, well, the, the actual agenda here is to get to a world that is not biased toward brute force. The US does not get away with whatever they want because their ideas are better. They might be better. Personally, I think they are. But that's not why they get away with it. Why do they get away with it? Brute force. You don't like what we're doing? Watch out, the United States will come and introduce democracy to your country. So, we're being on the side of them, of, the, of, of this. Okay, so good. They have a set of morals, and we could actually say somehow we agree with them. You know, Abadai, you know, standing up. I mean, it's pretty tough to stand up to the U.S. So, so they passed test one. Test two. The world's or region's need for a key moral value that is not currently widely held or acted on and the leader's insight that this value can be enacted. Related to the first one, what is the value that is being introduced here? What is the arc of resistance introducing to the global dialogue? Who used to stand up to the US pretty effectively? The Soviet Union. 
Remember, you don't remember those days, right? How old were you in 89? Minus one. Minus one? Okay. Minus three. So, <laughs> minus three. So, in the good old days, we had a bipolar world. And we had what was called MAD. Mutual Assured Destruction. Which means if anybody starts a war, we're all dead. Which was really mad, right? Uh, because when I grew up, and I'm not joking now, we were confronted with the reality that any moment humanity can cease to exist in a flash, literally. That was a very disturbing thought as a kid. You know, actually, you can wake up and see the planes coming and <laughs> nuclear mushrooms all over the place and <laughs> we're, we're gone. Okay. This bipolar world has evaporated, and in the 90s, George Bush Sr., the father of George W. Bush, basically talked about a new world order in which there was one leader and everybody else had to follow. When the US went to war against Iraq in 2003, it was not just Syria or Palestine that stood up to the United States, it was also France. It was also Germany. France was so obnoxiously anti-George W. Bush that the friends of George W. Bush started a campaign in the US to remove the word French from the English language. I'm not joking. And people who were patriotic, stores, restaurants that were patriotic, were expected to call their pommes frites not French fries, but freedom fries. This is not a joke. I always wondered what Freedom kisses are, right? You know, this was what yeah. <laughs> okay, free some kisses, yeah. We, 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 don't, we don't want to go there, right? Okay, so. The concept is we need to transcend the monopolar world. We have to get beyond this idea that the U.S. gets to tell everybody what to do. And the U.S. was dominant in the 90s, not only militarily, but also, it's hard to remember that. Or imagine that now. Bravo, engineer. Bravo. Engineers are better political science. Who's political science in this room? <laughs> Why are the engineers better at political science than my own students? <laughs> See, now, go, now go tell the, the others you know, why that is. I mean, they go, oh, soft power, hard power. Well, they, they got it. They, they, like, they're interested in stuff, right? So soft power, hard power, economic leadership. The US dominated the world militarily, politically, economically. China was still a backward country. India was still a backward country. There, were, there was no such thing as BRICS. Let's see if a non-engineer can tell me what that is. Are you an engineer? You can't answer. Non-engineers, non -engineers. Okay, go for it. Uh, she's looking in her notes. <laughs> she's looking in her notes. <laughs> right. I always thought they put in South Africa just so it would sound better, right? Uh, because the South Africa is not the dominant co economy in Africa. What is the dominant economy in Africa? Nigeria. I'm sorry, right? Nigeria. Bravo. Go Nigeria. Anyway, so the, the project that we can attribute to Bashar al-Assad is creating a world that is not monopolar. A world where in all areas, politics, military, economics, culture, different countries have the same rights. So, go arc, arc of resistance number two. Third category. The courage to articulate and promote that value, often at significant risk to oneself. Now you can argue whether the president is actually at risk, but some of his major leaders have been killed. Recently a general, a leading general in the, in the Syrian army was killed. So they are putting themselves at risk it's to stand up to what they would assume to be foreign forces fighting on their land in coordination with Israel and the United States. Now you can argue that that's not true or that's true, or you could say, well, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. In the, beginning, it, in the beginning, it wasn't that way, and it was actually Assad who made it happen. Whatever you, you see, at the moment, point three applies as well. So, you see what we're doing here? We're using a theory. We're not just saying what we'd like to hear. Fourth, the fourth one 
is the most difficult. The communication and other skills to promote that value effectively. Is that, is that happening? Is the arc of resistance seen as an arc of resistance in Uruguay, Taiwan, Canada, Finland, Kazakhstan? No. Outside of this region, the immediate Middle East, and perhaps Venezuela, and Cuba, and North, Africa, North uh, Korea, very few people actually even know about it, let alone identify or support it. So they're doing a very bad job in promoting their cause. Now why is that? Why when you watch television about what's going on in Syria or Iran, or Ukraine for that matter, does everybody sort of get the same story? Okay, media domination. Media domination, good, okay. What's the term, that we, we've had it before, but I'll explain it again. What does binary mean? Computer language is zero, one. So there, one is CNN. Non-CNN is zero. Back in 2001, when Iraq invaded Kuwait and most of the world went to war against Iraq. Okay, 1991, right. This is why you don't want to use oral history, because people get their decades mixed up. Mixed up. Yeah, I, I can't remember which decade it was. That's how old I am. Okay, so was it 91 or 2001 or 2011? I'm not really sure. <laughs> or was it 81? <laughs> okay, back in 1991, when, uh, back in 1990, Iraq invades Kuwait. In 91, most of the world, allied with the U.S., goes to war or supports the war to liberate Kuwait. There was, there was a CNN journalist in Baghdad when the U.S. started bombing Baghdad, and he pointed his cameras to the sky, his video, his, TV camera and saw the American planes flying over Baghdad and he was just too thrilled with this shot, dropping bombs on Baghdad and he was below, but he couldn't stop, right? Because this is like too cool to be, to, be, <laughs> to be real, right? So we were watching the American planes bombing the CNN reporter and he didn't get hit. And back then, if you didn't support the American war to liberate Kuwait, which would be one, where would you go? Zero. Nowhere. You could just say, I don't like what's on CNN. In 2003, when the U.S. invaded Iraq, so this is 91, in 2003, when the U.S. invaded Iraq for the second time, what had changed? If you didn't like what was on CNN, you could watch BBC World. That's the same news. But what else could you watch? You could watch, if you, let's say you don't, let's say all you know is English. All you know, Fox News, yeah. All you know is English. Okay, let's say, okay, where can you go, Sky Channel? Okay, Fox News, Sky Channel, CNN, BBC World, all say the same thing. Al Jazeera English. What else can you watch? Russia Today. Press TV. Al Atija, which I don't know how to spell. <laughs> We're talking about the other side. It, when you want to find out what's going on in Crimea, you turn on CNN, you get one story. You, took on, you turn on Russia Today, it's the exact opposite. Who's destabilizing West, Eastern Ukraine, according to Russia Today? The US and the Ukrainian fascists. Did you know about the Ukrainian fascists? Did you ever hear anything about the Ukrainian fascists on CNN? Yeah, that is, no. Ukrainian fascists. When Hitler invaded Ukraine, which was part of the Soviet Union, he had a free Ukrainian army with him, sound familiar? Fighting with the Nazis in Russia. They were, some of them were captured, some of them escaped with the Nazis, and they came back after 1991. That's a fact, that's a fact. Yeah, they're not only fascists, they're Nazis. You didn't know about this? Why doesn't CNN tell you about this? 
So, this is a fact. This is a, this is a fact. Now the question is, do those fascists and ultra-nationalists make up 0.5% of the government in Kiev? Or 5%? Or 50%? You watch Russia today, they'll tell you it's 50%. You watch CNN, they won't, tell you, they won't tell you anything, right? So, what's this called, by the way? It's called, he, come on, engineers, do your, show, show me. <laughs> come on, engineers, <laughs> prove that you are Renaissance men and women, that you know everything. <laughs> Hershey. Hegemony. Hegemony, guys, hegemony basically means that you can reduce any conflict to a binary situation. Hegemony means that if I'm talking about the situation in Lebanon, it's either my way of seeing it or not my way of seeing it. There's no third option. If you want to find out what's going on in Lebanon and you only speak English, you can watch, I mean, even though Al Jazeera English is Qatari and thus somehow pro-American, they bring a lot of information that you won't find on CNN, a lot of factual information, and that alone will get you thinking. And then, of course, you have the other options like Press TV and Russia Today, which will give you their slant, their interpretation. So, and if you know, obviously, Al Manar is now a very professional TV station, seriously. So, this, this, is dirt, this is breaking through, breaking through the hegemonic control of zero one is called counter hegemonic. Now, if there's so much, so many options out there, why is the Ba'ath Party doing such a lousy job getting their message out? If you have Russia Today and Press TV and you have a lot of internet sites that are spreading information abundantly throughout the world, why is the position of the current Syrian government not better known? They're not very good at what you rightfully called soft power. Why is the Syrian government as opposed to the Iranian government, by the way, so bad at soft power. They never had to do it. Iran is a democracy. It's a lot of, it's a lot of other things, too. But it is, among other things, a democracy, which means the government has to learn how to play by the democratic rules, which means Iran, within the country, on the national level, has had to develop an ability to go beyond the hegemonic. Syria never allowed opposing voices. They don't have the skills. <laughs> okay, he's joking. He's joking. Don't joke. <laughs> I always wondered about that that point that that point one percent. That that one guy who voted against the government. Who is he? Who is he? Because, oh, because even in the Soviet Union, it was like 3% that voted against the government. Uh, but yeah, okay. Okay, go ahead. Uh, you don't mean Charlie Chaplin, you mean the other one? Oh, anyway, I know I haven't. So, go ahead. Let's look at some of the examples of global moral leadership presented in the article, which I'm assuming that everybody's read. Yes? Shh. Right. Well, not the Soviet, the yeah. Russian, yeah. Good question. Very good question with respect to point four. Are we actually able to get the truth? No. Wait, wait. 
The truth is relative. So, the fact that I'm standing here, is that the truth? Yes. It's a, it's a tangible fact. It's something that you can get your thumb around. This is why we, we, we grasp things, right? The thumb has to go around it. There's a difference between facts in the natural sciences and, the fa and facts in the social sciences and humanities. What's the difference? When we, uh, what, what's, does anybody know who Heisenberg is? Heisenberg, heard of him? Okay. What's his famous theory about? Heisenberg's theory about? Yeah, but his theory about when, when, when you observe something. His theory of uncertainty. Heisenberg's theory of uncertainty. Heisenberg proved that if you study something in physics, the moment you start studying it, the thing you're studying changes. That's true, even in physics. When you, when you observe something in the physical world, the physical it doesn't, have, it doesn't have a brain. It starts changing, but slightly. It's not, it's, not in, it's not significant in the sense that your results are altered by the fact that you study something, but it does change. Now, if things change according to Heisenberg's theory of uncertainty in the physical world, we're talking about atoms or waterfalls or whatever, what about the social world, when you start observing something? If someone would come in here with, if three, the three men in suits would walk in here and sit over there and with clipboards and start writing stuff down, would you change your behavior? I bet you stop. <laughs> CIAs, whatever, right? So, I'll try that, I'll try that next class. Okay, so in the, in the social sciences and humanities, things always change. One is the theory of reactivity. Anything you study in political science, sociology, anthropology, and all the social sciences, humanities, the moment you start studying it, it changes its behavior dramatically. Let's say we wanted to find out uh, what it's like to live. Uh, when I moved here, I went down to Uzai and bought my furniture. I thought, it's cheap. Uzai. Ozai. Yeah, we went down to Ozai. You can get really good deals down there, right? So let's say we wanted to know how Ozai works. So I get a couple of my students, and we would rent an apartment, and we'd move into our apartment in Ozai. Would the behavior of our neighbors change? Yes. Especially when they knew we were studying them. Would their behavior change? Yes. yes. You would not get accurate results because they would start for whatever reason, start altering their behavior to, to adapt to the fact that there's people here studying them. So, reactivity. But how many of you have been shopping in Ozai? Anybody besides me? Okay, I bet if you'd, okay, I'll give you a better example. My students in political science and law faculty were going up on a regular basis to Akar in the north, Beautiful place, by the way. To a town, small town called Berkesla. You know it? Berkes say it the right way. Berkesla, right? And, and we're working with Syrian refugees in the refugee camps. Now, you saw the pictures on Facebook. OK. What happened was not only did the behavior of the Syrian refugees in the refugee camps change when we started studying them, which would be reactivity, or Heisenberg's theory of uncertainty, the people who were studying the Syrian refugees changed too. You understand what I mean? So all my NDU students from Kissard Wayne, they go, yeah, we know Syria. <laughs> we know what we're talking about, right? And they go with, and they work with little kids who are taking French lessons so they can get into the Lebanese school system, and they go, oh, they're so cute. And they meet their families, and they go, oh, they're normal people. Because these are people from Kassar and other towns on the border who, who got kicked out of their towns, and they're trying to live normally. They invite you in, and they give you coffee and biscuits because they want to be guests, hosts, right? Because they used to have houses and businesses and schools, et cetera. So they're, they're, ch they're changing as well. This is called subjectivity. So when we're doing research on point four in Hansen's list. 
whenever you study something, the things you're studying change. And when you study things that are controversial, you change. So the question, is there truth? Not in the sense of the physical world. But if we would factor these two things in, we can get results that are useful. Now in the area of media, what we can look at is who's really good at playing the global media game against the United States's or the US government's intention. What was the last time you had a media scandal that, where your perception of the US changed dramatically in a negative sense? You said, oh, I thought they were really good guys. That, now they're, they're, WikiLeaks. Obviously, <laughs> thank you for the echo. Uh, obviously, Snowden and Assange are pretty good at not having any influence over CNN. They can play the game. They can play CNN like a violin. So why are they good at it and Bashar al-Assad isn't? This is the question. So to get at this, we have to you know, study things. There is no exact truth in, the, in this field, but there are reliable results that we can use. OK. Let's look now at some of the examples from the book about moral leadership. I always like to take one because it feeds back into, start with one, feeds back into something we've dealt with previously, which is the Pope. You know, for the first time I actually thought I might go see the Pope. Jordan is so close, I'm like, I'm tempted to fly to Jordan just to see the Pope. It's the first time in my life, I'm not even Catholic, but this guy, I just, this guy is a rock star, right? <laughs> He's now he's going to Jordan, right? This guy's a rock star. I, I was actually tempted to buy one of those tickets and go to Jordan and be a groupie, right? As a Protestant, right? I would, he's, a, he's a pope that everybody loves somehow, right? Okay, the pope. Is the pope a global, or are some popes global moral leaders? Okay, this, this, this is what I like about teaching political science, that the world's always changing. Turn to page 84. 297, and we see reference to rerum no varum. And this page in this reader is also another wonderful example because it tells you why you shouldn't plagiarize. When was rerum no varum, which is an encyclical, a papal official document, when was it issued? When was it, when was it proclaimed, according to the book? 1892, which is wrong. It was 1891. So, <laughs> so the book's wrong. I don't know why Kirk Hansen got that wrong by one year, but it's wrong. So if, you, if you're quoting this and you write Kirk Hansen page da da da, and I say wrong, and you go, but it's in the book, then I can go check. But if you say that's your own information, then you're wrong. This is one of the reasons why you should not plagiarize. Because what if the source is wrong? That's, that's basically just it's simply wrong, right? OK, what was Rerum Navarum? A papal encyclical is a Catholic version of a fatwa. A fatwa is a statement by the ulima, the scholars, what, uh, in, in the Muslim world. What's the difference between Islam the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Protestant Church on the one hand, and Catholicism on the other. No one the other ones don't have a pope, right? There's no one person in the Orthodox Church who everybody listens to. Because yeah. the, the Orthodox churches are national churches. The largest Orthodox Church being Russia. the Russian, right? So you're all going to listen to the Russians from now on? No. We're Greek Orthodox or we're Armenian Orthodox. We don't have to listen to them. Protestants are even worse, and in Islam it's the same thing. There are no central authorities that have a right to speak for everyone. Whereas in Catholicism, papal encyclicals, when they're on theology, are infallible. What does that mean? What does infallible mean? They cannot be mistaken. Infallible does not mean that the pope can't make mistakes. 
I always used to say this, but now it's actually no longer a joke. You call up Francis, say, hey Francis, hi, I'm your old buddy, can you tell me if it's going to rain tomorrow? He'd probably find that funny. He'd go, hey, how, how the hell should I know? Or let's say, yes, and it doesn't rain. Does that mean the Pope's not infallible? It's not, it's not, yeah, it's not, it, does, it means that his statements cannot be challenged. As long as he's Pope, you cannot question his authority. When he, when he dies or retires and somebody else becomes Pope, they can change it, the next Pope. So, this encyclical basically established the moral responsibility it's mandatory. There's no ifs and whats about it. For us, not only to help the poor, but to ask why they're poor. What's the difference? Helping the poor means haram, everybody has, a, has an unlucky break, widows, orphans, people with disabilities, haram. People have been doing this forever and it's a great thing. But asking why people are poor, if you go to Kiss or Wayne, to a large factory owned by a Maronite, and 95% of the workers are Maronite, and they're being underpaid, which is probably going to happen. Could we find a business like that with low wages? So why is that Maronite factory owner not treating his Maronite workers fairly? What would the Pope say? What would the Pope call that? He would have a very simple word, a three-letter word for it, called sin. You like that? Okay. <laughs> it's sin. And there's no, what, or there's no way around it. Now, Rerum Novarum was in 1891. The current pope is really picking up on this. What, why was, in 1891, why was it so important to deal with social injustice? Yes. Who, which, which political party in Europe was attracting most of the workers. The communists, the, com the Marxist parties. The Marxist parties were saying, you guys want to have a better living, have better living conditions? Come and join us. The conservatives don't care for you. The liberals don't care for you. The, the only people who care for you are the socialists. And why do the socialists care for the poor? Because we are poor. Self-interest. So, the Catholic Church needed a response to the siren call of the Marxist political movements, and this was Rerum Navarum. Why is it happening again? All of a sudden? We're facing communism today. No, we're not. <laughs> of, of all the things we're facing, communism is not one of them, uh, for better or for worse. At the moment, there's no communist threat. But we are facing facing massive poverty, social injustice, imbalance in the world. And for the first time in human history, we have a pope from what is often called the third world. There were three candidates, one from Kenya, one from the Philippines, and one from Argentina. By the way, if you see my car, I have an Argentinian flag. Yeah. I know nothing about football, I just like tango, right? So, the, <laughs> it's a, the tango is what, I, have, I don't even know, are they any good, right? Are they gonna win? Anyway, so, why was the choice of an Argentinian pope smarter and more threatening than a Kenyan or a Filipino pope? What's, what's the guy's, what's the, the pope, where, where does his family come from originally? Italy. So we have an Italian, Latin American, he's Western. You can't say, well, you know, he's sort of, you're not like us. He's not like us. Yeah. He's, he, he's very close to the Europeans. So when he says that, you can't say, well, you know, he's African or he's Asian, you know. He's like us and very much like Lebanese. Why do Lebanese who go to Mexico or Argentina just disappear? Because they look like Mexicans and Argentinians, right? They just fit right in, right? So. This is the last point for today. Global moral leadership transcends. And the transcending here was bringing in the issue that being unjust is a sin.